So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gerilyn Williams. I use she, her, and clean pronouns, and I am a program coordinator in the Pace and Pacific Engagement and the program lead for a month of service. Thank you so much for joining us for this panel today. Um, we are really excited for you to join the Pace Center as we gather to learn more from our local community leaders. Um, as we begin our time today, I'd like to do a bit of house cleaning. Um, so during today's conversation, we ask that folks stay muted until the open Q&A section um, of the event. We know that it's lunchtime, so feel free to eat, handle anything else we need to do. Um, we're recording, um, but you can always you know, keep your camera off or on, um, whatever makes sense for you. Um, please do introduce yourself in the chat. Um, we'd love to know who's here. Um, the chat can also be a space to share any questions or put things down. Sometimes I know like things will pop up in my brain and if I don't write them down or put them somewhere, I might forget it for later. Uh, you know, we are recording for later sharing um, and should you have any technical issues, please reach out to either Lydia Owens or Gwen McNamara um, in direct uh, chats that you can do um, through the like comment section. So at Princeton, we specifically acknowledge that we occupy the ancestral and unceded lands of the Lenny and Lenape and Muncie Lenape peoples. We are gathering online today and I'd like to take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization in our technology systems, education, service, and society. We benefit today from equipment and connectivity not available to many communities. Technologies whose carbon footprints contribute to changing climate and disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. The same can be said of our food systems, about who can grow food, who can eat it, how we eat it, who profits, and all the inequitable systems at work that make food a privilege and not a right in our communities and around the world. So as you might have heard, our theme this year for Month of Service is food justice. Um, our practice of community engagement at PACE is centered on community knowledge, community challenges, and community solutions. So as we navigate this pandemic, one topic that has been constantly on our minds in our conversations and centered in our actions has been food accessibility. Before this pandemic, it has always been historical, systemic, deeply rooted problem, and now it's only been exacerbated. Our partners at Arm and Arm, Princeton Mobile Food Pantry, Trenton Area Soup Kitchen, Anger House, Send Hunger Pack in Princeton, and many more have been on the front lines of our community, creating change and feeding families. And we are so grateful to be working alongside them this month and all year. So food justice is a complex movement around food as a human right. It is rooted in the belief that communities everywhere have the right to produce, process, distribute, access, and eat good food, regardless of race, class, gender, ethnicity, citizenship, ability, religion, or community. The movement envisions a food system that is inclusive, community-led, and participatory, without the exploitation of peoples, land, or the environment. It identifies and acts to remove the significant structural inequities that exist within our food and economic systems. Food justice activists seek to establish healthy, resilient communities with equitable access to nourishing and culturally appropriate food. This month, we are highlighting the leaders and organizations in our community that work to uphold this right through education around food, the growing of food, the policies around food, the accessibility of food, and more. We hope that this time together will connect and empower us in ways that help us support our local communities, as well as make decisions and take actions that create sustainable and wide sweeping change. Uh, we will be in conversation today with Rick Kelly from Cornerstone Community Kitchen, uh, Joyce Campbell from Trenton Area Soup Kitchen, and Sarah Beluso from Princeton University's Campus Dine Sustainability. There will be time at the end for the questions and discussion of the large group. Um, so I'd like to begin with some introductions. Um, if each of our panelists could share your name, your pronouns if you'd like, your title, the organization you're part of, and what do you do as part of that organization? Um, I think let's start with Joyce. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joyce Campbell, and I'm the executive director here at TASC, also known as Trenton Area Soup Kitchen. Um, and basically what I do is oversee the whole thing. <laughs> but what I always say, I'm just the executive director. I don't know the details. There's, I have incredible staff. And I just want to let everybody know that today marks 40 years from when the first meal was served uh, for Trenton Area Soup Kitchen. And we had just a very brief program this morning. Um, fortunately, you know, we had um, some Senator Turner 
uh, Assemblyman Benson, Mayor Gassior, we had some folks that have been very supportive. Um, and as I said to them, you know, I, I, as we've approached 40, I don't know if I'm sad or glad. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm sad that we're still doing this, um, but we are so fortunate to have the support that we have to be able to continue to provide what we do to the, the people that we serve. And our, you know, our network kind of keeps expanding, which again is good. <laughs> um, you know, we actually opened our 33rd uh, community meal site yesterday at Trinity uh, United Methodist Church, which is actually the first church where the first meal was served. So it's a really awesome day for us here. But again, you know, so many issues that we'll be talking about. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, Rick, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. My name is Rick Kelly. I'm a weekly volunteer and a board member at the Cornerstone Community Kitchen. We're located in the basement of the Princeton United Methodist Church, right at the corner of Van Deventer and Nassau Street, right across from the Garden Theater. We've been around for nine years. <clears throat> it was started by Larry Apperson when he was 80 years old, 81 years old, God bless him. And um, we are basically a satellite of task. We are open on Wednesday evenings. Well, pre-COVID, we were open Wednesday evenings from approximately five to 6.30, we would feed about 85 to 90 people every Wednesday night. We have uh, white table, white linen tablecloths. We have somebody playing the piano. We have a free clothing store. We would give free haircuts. Uh, we give free ESL lessons. Uh, we would have a nurse come in to do blood pressure screening, things like that. Um, we are a soup kitchen, but we like to think of ourselves as so much more. Our niche is really in our name, and that's community, Cornerstone Community Kitchen. We don't ask any questions. We have uh, people who are very, very much in need, and we actually had a multimillionaire come every week just because he enjoyed the company. Um, so uh, now that COVID has come, we closed down the ability for people to come into our kitchen on March 18th of 2020, so it's been almost two years. What we do now is we bag up all the food, we deliver to about 20 people and to their door. We have two volunteers that make 10 deliveries each. And then myself and a few other people um, actually bag up all the food and we have people come to the door and we just distribute to the door. So we're still distributing over hundred meals a week. It's just in a different way. So that's, uh, that's our story. Thank you, Rick. Sarah, you're next. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Bavuso. I'm the sustainability manager for Princeton's uh, campus <coughs> department. While our primary mission is nourishing our campus community, uh, including our students and faculty staff at the first campus center and cafes and also our alumni through events and the general public through our concessions program. Um, part of a, a large part of what I do is monitoring waste, which ties into um, food insecurity in some major ways, but it's also educating our students and trying to instill an ethos of sustainability that we all hold near and dear so that when they go out into the world, they leave with kind of that, that consciousness of how to relate to things in society and food injustice is in, and food insecurity is one of those major points for them. Um, part of what we do in non-COVID times, we have a food donation program that started well before I joined Campus Dining over 20 years ago where students would go to dining halls and pick up trays of prepared food, drive them around in their personal cars or um, on the back of bicycles, or we're not really sure how it all happened, but um, over time that program kind of fell apart. And starting in, I wanna say 2015, we started the process of establishing a very formal relationship through the Food Donation Connection, which is a mission-based organization that connects people who have food to donate to the folks who need it most. And through that um, 
partnership, it took us over two years to get through all of the liability and legal aspects of contract review to get this, to get this partnership with um, food donation solidified. And through them, we found a harvest partner, um, Bentley Community Services, who is, their distribution site is on Route 1 in Monmouth Junction, but they um, service a much broader um, area than that. They reach Princeton, they reach south of Princeton, they kind of get up into Somerset County a little bit also. Um, and what they do is they provide a support service for folks who fall above the poverty line, but below the Alice line. So Alice is um, asset limited, income constrained employed, according to the United Way. It's a branch of um, some research that they do. And in New Jersey right now, for a family of four in 2018, that was $50,000. So if you can imagine stretching $50,000 just for your basic needs. And um, some of these folks are kind of one step away from falling back under that poverty line. So it's a really important kind of safety net that they provide and they provide education to help people get back on their feet when they have some kind of catastrophic event. So it's a really important part of our state that nobody really thinks about because the poverty line and Joyce and Rick, you can correct me, it's about 10% of our state population, but those um, between poverty and the top of the Alice line is another 27%. So it's, it's a great service they provide. Thank you for sharing and introducing yourselves. Actually, Sarah, I'll come back to you. Um, and I want to know from three of you, what drew you to this kind of work? Well, I, I was emailing Geraldine last night. I said, you know, thank you so much for that question because my family has always been very service oriented. Back to my grandparents um, taking me to all kinds of um, volunteer opportunities from the time, first one I remember I was five years old. So I was thinking about it, I was like, geez, I really should be motivated that my mom, when she was in her 80s, 80s, would go into Philadelphia's Love Park or to Atlantic City with our church group and make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in the dead of winter for folks who were homeless in that area. But that's not really what motivated me. Um, there's a chef who's a James Beard award-winning chef. His name is Michelle Nissan. And he is, he kind of takes food insecurity to another level because he talks about nutrition insecurity. And I met him in about 2007, I want to say, on a panel um, at a national conference. I was brand new to sustainability, brand new to campus dining. Here I was on this national stage with someone that I kind of viewed as an icon. And he was, he is just so optimistic about being able to connect people with healthy food, not just accessible food, but it has to be healthy and it has to be nutrient dense. And he came up with this um, whole program based on food as medicine. And it's called, it's a prescription plan where you, your physician writes a prescription and that helps you get more healthy fruit, fresh fruit and vegetables at farmer's markets and places like that. So you can kind of um, double your snap dollars almost at different farmer's markets. And I thought, man, what an amazing way to look at nutrition and being able to, um, he uses private dollars to, to match what the federal dollars are to set up a model to do it. And I thought, what, what an amazing path to take from being this chef that I saw on PBS that I'm sitting next to on this stage talking about organic pasta and organic tomatoes to where he is and what he was doing. And I always think about him whenever I feel a little bit lost. I go back to those days about how optimistic he is and how forward thinking he is. So that's kind of where I get my inspiration. Wonderful. Joyce, how about you? What drew you to this work? Well, I, I've been uh, 
sort of in anti-poverty work probably for most of my professional career. And um, interestingly, I didn't even, I didn't begin to think about that to probably about 10 years ago. And um, I mean, it's a simple, I think it's a simple thing in some respects that I remember when I was about six year old, six years old, my best friend didn't have the things I had. And it was clear to me, there was a difference in the way that we lived. Um, and uh, I think I just always felt bad. I felt that it wasn't right. Um, you know, we have all these resources. And then, you know, probably when I was about eight or nine years old, you know, they're send, starting to send people off to space. And of course, you know, as a young self, and even now I still don't truly understand why <laughs> intellectually I get it, um, why we're doing it, but I'm like all that money, um, you know, so it was something pretty early on. And so things in my family where people were impacted by inequity um, or just not accessing or knowing about things that can help them. So I think that was really, you know, what got me started, um, what's kept me going um, is the amazing resilience of the people that we serve. I don't know that I would ever, you know, be able to get through some of the circumstances um, and then yet still feel gratitude. Um, so <laughs> that kind of keeps me centered every day. It reminds me, um, I've done a lot of advocacy work. I also really feel it's really important for the people who are impacted to have their voices heard. Uh, Cause you know, I'm a white girl from the suburbs, quite honestly, <laughs> I have my heart in it, but I have not lived it. So about 10 years ago, um, I was going to Washington DC to a homeless conference. Um, and I was bringing at that time I was at Catholic Charities. One of our clients who had a master's degree fell into drug use, homelessness, was homeless in Camden, Camden shelter, lived in the shelter in Trenton, whatever. Then he was finally on his own. So he was going to come and talk about from his viewpoint. And I remember when we got there, he was in the overflow hotel and <laughs> I called and checked to make sure he was okay. And I listened to myself and I said, I don't know why I'm checking to see if you're okay. You've survived on the streets of Camden. So like, you know, just then taking a look at that person and saying, my goodness, what have they gone through? And I, I see that every day here. And I think it's, it's this, and again, cause we're in a certain frame of mind cause of this 40th thing, but um, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's that sort of a point where you come to and say, I'm going to keep my dream. The North star is that there's no poverty and no hunger, but I'm not going to let that get in the way of, of having voices heard at this point. You know, I think that's a really important piece. And, um, it, just one qu other quick comment. It's so important, it's so interesting, Sarah, you know, your particular role, I'll, I'll probably be calling you again. Um, we just had a leadership uh, half day planning meeting the other day. And um, this whole, we are constantly trying to look at how are we environmentally friendly? You know, what are we doing towards sustainability with our food and the need for us to probably say, hey, we want another set of eyes in again. I mean, we've done several things. <laughs> We actually do meet the um, the ton amount of wastage that the state bill says you need to uh, recycle your food if you can find someone close. We actually started that almost a year ago. Um, so I may be contacting you <laughs> for some help with that because we also we always just want to revisit it. And I have one person on my team who is the voice of that. Uh, any planning meeting, she reminds us, she brings us back. And um, I'm always grateful for that. So that's it. <laughs> I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> you know, I wish we got all the time. Definitely want to dig deeper. You know, maybe we'll, uh, you know, add some other conversations on as we go. It'd be lovely. Um, but we'll go to Rick now for, you know, what drew you to be a part of Cornerstone? Like Sarah, my parents are very involved in charitable work. My I don't mean to one-up Sarah and her mother with her PB&Js in Love Park. My father is 93 and still delivers Meals on Wheels twice a week. Um, it's, I, I have very, very good role models. I'm lucky in that respect. But I was working as an instructional aide at Johnson Park Elementary School about 10 years ago. And um, for anybody that knows Liliana Morania, who's probably half the people on this, 
once you get sucked into Liliana's orbit, you cannot pull away. And I mean that as a compliment, as the utmost compliment. Um, so I, um, I got very involved in SHUP. I got very involved in uh, Princeton Children's Fund. And then we had a thing at Johnson Park where all the Halloween candy the kids didn't want, they would all bring it into school. And then after I got done sifting through it, I would take it down to task. You'll notice you never got any baby Ruth's Joyce. That's because I ate them all. At any rate, um, it was just, I don't know, 40, 50 pounds of candy, ridiculous amount of candy that I take down to task. And Liliana would say, you know, you don't have to take it all the way down to Trenton. There's a soup kitchen right there in Princeton and uh, bring it there. I just happened to go there on a Wednesday night when they were getting ready. Larry Apperson was there, we hit it off. And I said, do you ever need any help here? And he goes, yeah. And I said, okay, I'll be here next Wednesday. And I've been there every Wednesday since. That was six or seven years ago. So I just kind of fell into it. I love the people that volunteer, Maria being one of them. Um, I love the people that come. I love our patrons. I've gotten to know a lot of them very, very uh, personally. And um and we're doing good work at the same time. So it's a it's a win-win. Wonderful. Yeah, I do think um, a lot of service and community is really about relationships. And you know, those relationships <clears throat> sustain you. They connect you to new possibilities and opportunities. And when you have those relationships, it makes it much easier to sustain your engagement, to sustain um, the work. So I'm glad to hear a lot of these connections. Um, so I think I'm gonna go over to Joyce and ask, you know, what are some of the trends or issues you're seeing around um, your work lately or even when it just comes to our local area like Mercer County, um, what have you been seeing? Well, I think that uh, a couple of things. First of all, we're our two years, like everybody said, and March 18th, that would have been your day because it was March 16th, Monday here. <laughs> and by the way, just to say, I, that Cornerstone Kitchen, what you do on Wednesdays when you're able to be open is, is just amazing. Um, but anyways, um, you know, the, the pandemic has kind of colored a lot of what's going on. Um, but I think, you know, our main facility here is in Trenton. And we are back to serving two meals Monday through Thursday and lunch on Fridays. We did not see an increase in people here during COVID, okay, which I think is very important to note. But we have a number of meal sites, including, you know, at Cornerstone. We have two other sites in Princeton, three in Heightstown, Yardville. We are now doing 10 uh, senior um, housing in Trenton. Um, the, all as a result of the pandemic to try to reach out to where hunger is. And number, the other thing we realize is that folks who are newly, um, are new to quote hunger, so to speak, I don't know another way to put it, they're not gonna come to Trenton area soup kitchen on Esther Street in Trenton. I mean, it just is, the pantries are what really we're dealing with a lot of it. Uh, and also getting it, we started also a partnership with the Muslim Center of Greater Princeton. They are wonderful partners of ours. Um, and they purchased a van on where get provide the meal. So now, you know, they're hitting a couple other places in Trenton, Ewing and going over the river to Morrisville. Uh, we get a lot of support from Bucks County. And the, uh, what, what also happened, we have three sites in Heightstown, uh, but we know that Rise was dealing with three times the amount of requests for their pantry. Um, so what we did, we were, you know, when the pandemic hit, I mean, I think one of the major things for us is we are blessed by the community with a lot of donations. But we knew the intent of a lot of that was not just to serve our people here in Trenton. We have our main site and a few other uh, community meal sites, which just for your, Rick, we keep trying to change from satellite to community meal site because I just see this disc in the sky, but <laughs> it's hard for all of us. <laughs> um, You're the mothership, Joyce. That's right. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, what we did was we said, we're not going into the pantry business. That's not our niche. Our niche is preparing warm meals. Um, we give out all sorts of other pant stuff we do get, 
but so we approached rise they had done several drive uh you know drive through food distributions they knew the logistics we purchased the food and we've done that four times with them so i think what it's just what it says about where the food need is today is that it's basically everywhere and you know if we say our, our mission is to feed the hungry in the trenton and mercer area that's what we keep our eye out for you know trenton i don't say no brainer but yeah trenton and then other areas where you know like rick said there there is there are pockets of poverty throughout mercer county and you know again i love the point sarah about the alice study uh, there's also um Legal Services of New Jersey uh, does a thing on the what it costs to really live, which is very similar. There's so many people just struggling. So I think <clears throat> that's one that we're dealing now. We continue to deal with food and nutrition insecurity. Um, and I don't know yet quite yet what the inflation impact is going to be, but I expect we're going to be seeing some of that pretty soon around our sites. And that, that's the thing that concerns me. What is what does that mean? What's it gonna look like? And how long is it gonna last? Thanks, Joyce. Yeah. What about you? What are you seeing in terms of, you know, trends or issues that are coming up? Other trends or issues? You know, it's a lot of other stuff related. <laughs> I have to say, we do a lot um, more than just providing food. We have adult education, we do job search, um, we have case managers. One of our major services we provide to people is something things people don't think about, which is helping people get their identification back, which is really difficult uh, in many instances. Um, and uh, they folks cannot get SNAP. SNAP's a great benefit, but you can't get that unless you have your identification. So that's a huge, huge piece um, that, and in fact, we've been, been working on that um, because the DMV has put a lot of barriers in the way, uh, put barriers in the way for everybody, we know that, um, you know, so, um, so I, I guess, you know, in terms of trends, I tend to think of the whole thing. Um, and, and, and with that, um, you know, there's a whole food desert thing. I, I know it's New Jersey Spotlight, did an article and um, New Jersey Economic Development Authority has money to work on uh, food desert relief. And one of the things that um, Tara Colton talked about in our article was about some retailers will not allow <coughs> SNAP recipients to place orders online, which the retail is only part of the problem. The other part of the problem is people having access <laughs> To, to technology, that's another issue we're facing constantly. So like that, you know, so it, it's, it's food, but it's all the related stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Rick, Sarah, do you have any other like trends or issues that are coming to mind from your perspective? Go ahead, Sarah. I, I think we come to kind of come to the table from a different, from a different perspective. Um, a lot of what we're seeing in, in our world is supply chain issues. And that's something that we, we talk about in our office on a, a daily basis. Um, we run menus that are very structured and um, it's forcing us to kind of look at things a little bit differently. And because some things are just not available. You want a four ounce chicken breast? Uh, okay, in a couple of weeks, maybe you can get that. Or if you want chicken wings, maybe not. So it's really forcing us to, to think about our menus a lot differently, which um, it, it's, you know, there's a lot of momentum when you talk about the number of meals that we serve every day and the number of students that we serve every day, trying to put the brakes on that machine and, and make a quick turn is not easy. It's kind of like, changing the direction of that ship. It um, takes a lot of moving pieces to get everybody going in the same direction. At the same time, we're seeing students um, looking for more variety in their vegan options and um, more plant-based um, dairy products and, or not dairy, but dairy alternatives and also kind of meat analogs. So it's it's really shifting, it's shifting the way we think a lot. And um, in general, when you're, 
when you're looking at where the population is going, we're also seeing probably 2030, 2050, really shifting where diets are going and the, the cultural makeup of our, of our country to see what those, what those diets are going to be. And it's going to shift away from, from what generally think is the American diet and where is that gonna go? And honestly, how is like government subsidy gonna play into that when we have a lot of um, subsidies around dairy and a lot of our population can't, um, can't eat dairy products. It's just something that doesn't work for them. And when are we gonna see kind of some of those subsidies around soy milk or other alternatives? And I think that's something that I've been watching for, geez, 20 years almost. And it's still, there's not a lot of movement there, but I think as, as you really start to see the, the demographics of the country change, we're gonna to start to see some of those change. And the other big thing, and this goes to what Joyce was talking about sustainability wise and food waste, there is just a much, there's much more attention being brought to the table for food waste and how that impacts um, environmental justice in so many ways. It's just not the wasted food that's not getting to the people who need it. It's the food that's going into the landfills and the landfills that are um, built next to the lower income housing and how it impacts just a wide variety of um, people in an adverse way because they're already at a disadvantage and now we're putting power plants to um, to support waste digestion <laughs> right in that same na neighborhood. So I think there's a lot more attention coming to that and our students are very focused on some of those issues. So I think those are kind of some industry trends that we're seeing. Rick, anything on your end? At Cornerstone itself, we've noticed a, a big drop off in the number of people that we see. I mean, we would have regulars, we would have, you know, of the 85 or so people we would serve every week, I'd say 75 were there every single week. Um, we maybe only see 20 of those anymore. So I don't know if it's, I don't really know what the reason of that is. I don't know if it's uh, transportation limitations. Uh, I don't know if they're getting food from other places. I don't know. Um, I don't know. It may, I think a lot of people, as I mentioned, just came for the community aspect. Now that we don't have a sit down meal, you know, they don't come. Um, but I do have a lot of people saying, when is it going to open? When is it going to open? But because of the, the COVID protocols in place at the Princeton United Methodist Church, where, where we're based, um, you know, I don't think they're anytime soon that we're going to open, sadly. On a broader basis, a positive thing that I've noticed is just the number of organizations in Princeton that have sprung up to address food insecurity. You've got Share My Meals, which only started, I think it's two years this month. They've served over 90,000 meals in two years, which is incredible. And they provide us with 55 meals each week. And it's the highlight. No, I'm not trying to diss Trenton in what we get from them, but these meals that we get from Share My Meals, I mean, they are restaurant quality meals. There are eight or nine restaurants now participating. We get our, we happen to get our meals from Meeting House and it's the same thing every week. It's a chicken breast, mashed potatoes and green beans. And people rave about this stuff and for, for good cause because I haven't tried one myself, but it smells great. At any rate, um, so you've got Share My Meals. We've got uh, JFCS, which has a big, huge box truck that delivers fresh produce to us every week. That's the Jewish, what is that? Help me, Jewish Family and Children's Services, I think. And they're, they're on uh, Alexander Road right off of Route 1, uh, down by Carnegie Center. You've got uh, Mercer Street Friends, you've got Arm and Arm, you've got Liliana's organization, the Prince of Mobile Food Pantry, who's just killing it. I mean, it's just incredible what they do. Um, so, and, and that only really 
ramped up about two years ago. So that's a positive development. Sometimes I wonder how can there even be any food insecurity in Princeton because we have so many different outlets. And I was in the Navy and we were taught never to complain unless you have a solution. And I complain and I have yet to really do much about solving this, but I wish all of these organizations would be under one umbrella, perhaps under Princeton Health and Human Services, because a lot of times the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. You know, like I didn't know that that Sarah is very involved with Bentley until yesterday. We get a lot of our stuff from Bentley. Um, obviously, we get a lot of stuff from Task. <clears throat> if there was a clearinghouse or one central place where people could meet, I don't know, monthly, if we just knew what each other did and that we even exist, I think we could be a lot more efficient in, in addressing the needs of the community. And I think we could do a much better job, perhaps, of letting people know all of the things that are available to them. You know, there, there might be a lot of people living below the poverty line that don't even know all these things exist. And that can be exasperating at times. We do get new people that show up every Wednesday and they'll say, I didn't even know you guys were here because we have a like a flag that flies outside of the church and they see it and they're drawn down or they see a crowd of people and they want to see what's going on. And they're like, oh, we didn't even know you were here. And, you know, my God, we've been here nine years. You know, we, we, we'd we love to give you food uh, or clothes. Clothes are a real big thing for us. I think people are more drawn by the clothes sometimes than the food. Um, so that's a couple trends and a couple observations. I would love, you know, since I'm the one complaining, I should be the one spearheading it, but I, I haven't done it. <laughs> no ideas. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Maria do it. She's not doing anything. She's only involved in about five different things. Um, so one thing I think is important, and I think we have constant conversations, especially um, you know, at pace with our students. I have a history background, and I'm always like, what is the what is at the root of this? You know, what is underneath um, that, you know. We don't talk about enough. And so I'm wondering, um, maybe starting with Joyce, can you share, you know, in your perspective, what are some of the root causes of, you know, food insecurity, of, you know, the the issues that you are working to to solve? Yeah. Uh, What's down there? Yeah, I mean, food is just, I always say that, you know, food is actually simple. <clears throat> Uh, you know, feeding someone, getting a belly full for a bit, but why that person needs that food is much more complex. Um, you know, my, you know, feeling is definitely, you know, it, it's structural poverty, structural racism, you know, both of them kind of go hand in hand to create these ongoing systems uh, where people are not afforded uh, you know, opportunity even, and, um, you know, and, and that with the income inequality, these pieces just need very large, you know, high level sort of fixes and they need, but they need people to speak out. And I mean, I'm going to, this, this is really pretty global, but I mean, it, it, it's what to me lies at the root of it is that people need to understand that, you know, the federal poverty level is so outdated. <laughs> Even Alice, I know there's probably costs that people have that aren't in there that, you know, I can't pay the $20 fee for my kid to join the soccer league or these little things that just pull at your heartstrings that people can't afford that so many of us take for granted. And, um, you know, again, I, I spent almost 40 years in doing anti-poverty work basically. And um, task is what has really shown me that I think one of the major things to make a difference in that is the relationship. You know, if you're not in relationship, somehow you don't come upon somebody or someone who has been living in poverty that, I mean, we serve a lot of chronically mentally ill folks. I mean, quite honestly, if you're in your twenties and you have schizophrenia, you, you're chronically mentally ill, you're going to be poor unless you come from a family with wealth. I mean, it's just, it's really a shame. Um, but again, back to the relationship piece, I, I saw it here and heard about it here. Um, 
you know, from our volunteers who get to know uh, some of our patrons. And also prior to COVID, we had one-on-one -on -one face to face tutoring, which actually, again, we were hoping to start up, but that parts, we do have people in our dining room again. Um, but those folks would come in and be like, okay, I'm going to tutor someone. I'm retired from such and such. And, you know, they had a certain stereotype in their mind and through tutoring somebody several times a week and getting to know them, I think it really changed their heart and their mind. That's a big thing to do. Um, you know, and the other thing is we know how to do it. I mean, I think we know what works. Um, I think one of the best examples is the stimulus and the child tax credit um, that we have had with COVID. We could see how give a little more food or increase SNAP benefits brings down the level of food insecurity. Uh, it's still not acceptable, but you know, we know that investments in certain places bring people out of poverty. Um, we, know, we know what solves homelessness, oh, getting a house, you know, and it's not just a house, it's services. Um, so anyways, that, that's my, my feeling about it. It's, it's, you know, it's a big thing, but I think what it says is, and this is the last thing I'll say, um, having worked for Catholic Charities for 20 years before I came here, been here a little over five, you know, we already talked about chair, the two feet, charity and justice. It's very easy to do charity uh, in some respects. It's really hard to move people from charity to justice, which charity, you know, kind of doing all the good works, you see what's going on. Justice is the speaking out and the advocacy piece of it. And that's the part I've done a lot of work to try to engage people in that. Because you say advocacy and people think politics. It's not politics. <laughs> So that, that's my last piece that I try to move people, you know, including people who, you know, are impacted by things to have to share their story, make people more aware. Well, thank you so much. Yes, I love that idea. You know, um, yeah, justice is the hard is the hard part. Um, you know, the Colonel West quote is like, you know, justice is what love looks like in public. Um, and how we can move from, you know, hey, this is an issue, I guess I should like work on it or, you know, spend some energy on it, but then also thinking about, okay, well, yeah, this is an issue and what we're doing is helping, but how are we mitigating? How are we getting to those roots to say, you know, this is how we stop it. And this is how, you know, hopefully, like you were saying, Joyce, um, the hope is that if we do the good work and we do it together, like tasks won't have to exist the way it does. I said this to uh, my boss, actually, Kimberly, like the other day, it was like, you know, hey, like if we're doing the good work, the hope is that, you know, the work I do won't be as needed or the work the way I do it now. Um, so in continuing exactly. thinking about, you know, those roots, uh, you know, Sarah, Rick, um, y'all have perspectives on kind of what you're, uh, um, you know, what you've seen as roots underneath um, food accessibility. Yeah, I'll go first on this one. Um, it, it's just inherent, in, at least for us, for Princeton, it's it's just, uh, it's a byproduct of the town itself. It's a very, very barbell town. You have people who are very wealthy. You have people who are very poor. You have people in $5 million homes. You have people that clean those homes and that landscape those homes and people that cook those meals in the restaurants that, that people go to. Um, it's an expensive town. You know, if you, if you work 40 hours a week at $15 uh, an hour, that's 30 grand a year. That doesn't fly in Princeton, you know, it might fly in my hometown of Syracuse, but it's not gonna fly in Princeton. Damn, I mean, it doesn't even scratch the surface. So it's not surprising that whole area between John Street and Witherspoon Street is just filled with the people that we serve and it's not uncommon to see 10 people in a two bedroom house. And I know plenty of people in that situation. So the, the root cause is just the basic structure of the town itself. There's not much you can really do about that. Um, it's it just not. Sarah. I'm gonna kind of go back to the, the quality of the food that we have and thinking about the and accessibility of quality food. And um, it's not just access to food because 
there's plenty of places you can go and spend a buck and get a big old bag of chips, but that's, that's not nutrient dense. And I think a lot of, even though Princeton didn't come up as a food desert, think about being in the town. If you don't have transportation and you have to rely on some kind of public transportation to get to a grocery store. Now I love McCaffrey's, but not everybody can afford some of the offerings at McCaffrey's and to get to an Aldi or something that has some more affordable prices is just out of the question for a lot of folks in town. And then think about juggling all your groceries on a bus or a train. And it just, it becomes monumentally challenging. And I, I can imagine it would be very easy to be defeated. I thought about it the other day, if I had to ride a bike or walk to a grocery store from where I live. Now I chose to live in the middle of nowhere because I like the woods, but um, it would take me four hours to walk to ShopRite, <laughs> which how much can you carry back in, on a bike or something like that? So I think a lot of a lot of the problem that we have is that accessibility to um, the right food, not necessarily food, but the right kinds of food to nourish you and to have that, that full belly that's full of nutritious food, because you can look at all the nutrition studies and it shows that being, um, having the right foods helps you focus more, helps you learn more. It, it supports kids. It supports adults. It's just, that to me is where we really have room to improve. And I think that the, the new food desert designations are going to help a lot. And that's both rural and urban. It's not just all, it's not just all urban areas. So if those prove successful and there's more funding, maybe it will expand to, to help other areas. I'd like to add just a little bit more color to what Sarah said with regards to uh, good food, nutritious food. We get our food from a variety of sources at Cornerstone, at least a half a dozen every week. And so we don't get to choose what we get. We, we get, you know, you get what you get and you, and you, want to distribute all of it. We, we take pride in never throwing anything out. So sometimes we'll get, you know, a lot of chips or we get stuff from Wawa, like sizzly sandwiches and stuff like that, which isn't necessarily nutritious. We also get in season, we get a lot of produce from uh, Bentley and also from Cherry Grove Organic Farm on Carter Road in Lawrenceville. When the soup kitchen, when Cornerstone's open, um, what's the first thing people go for? They go for the chips. They go, you know, yesterday we had sliced and baked cookies and they were going crazy. Um, and the greens get left behind. So a lot of it is education. A lot of it is cultural, you know? Um, I, we, we don't want to throw anything out. So we walk a fine line. Do we throw out all those bags of chips that we get? I don't know, you know, I mean, would I rather see somebody eat chips than go hungry? Yeah, but do, are the chips good for them? We know that they're not, but it's a difficult spot for us. I'm so glad that you brought that up because this is, you know, we try hard to look at the nutrition. Um, it's again, we're, ba we're cooking in larger scales, which impacts us, but um, you know, nutrition insecurity has been something that we've been really talking about more because it's really, really critical. And, you know, there is much like you feel you have no choice, you know, as a nonprofit, you know, we rely on USDA food that comes through the food bank donations. Um, and then we purchase some food. Um, so then you have to look at cost. How much is in your budget? Do you really have a choice about the menu we make? In some respects, they try to do the best they can. I mean, canned salmon from the food bank, we made salmon cakes. I had one, I mean, quite honestly, we have great, we have chefs, real chefs. I, even at that, that just doesn't taste real great. Um, one of the things that we've been dealing with, and I think it's an important thing to think about, 
in the food industry, emergency food industry, look, look, look at what different ones say. $10, 10 meals, $10, 30 meals. Really? <laughs> what are you, what are you eating? Um, and I'll, My I'll wife tell, cooking. What's, yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it's, we're kind of almost working against ourselves. And I'm going to tell you, you know, we've gotten great ratings through Charity Navigator. And they decided to do a whole new thing on how they rate folks. I mean, we're still a four-star charity, but in the interim, they've decided they're looking at other beacons. And we failed on impact with the information we gave them last year. We failed. Our meals are too expensive. So, but we prepare our meals. We purchase food for our meals. We intentionally try to do X amount of ounce of protein. This is a starch vegetable you know i mean we have a salad bar here where, where we sit we try to add extras and so it's not i mean we have, so now we're looking back and saying okay you know a lot of people don't include their cost to operate or their cost to raise money to provide the food <laughs> so it's just it's an issue i want to bring up because i think it's really important i mean you can't do good nutrient dense food without spending some money. I, I, I have no problem waving my flag and saying, yeah, our meals are a little bit more expensive. Uh, you know, a food bank. You, you, and I know I, when I worked at Catholic Church, I worked in a food pantry. You got a bag of stuff, and then we said, okay, if you have four family, four people in your family, we're trying to give you enough for three meals. That's twelve meals. Was there really twelve meals in that bag to put together? I don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to put down pantries or food banks or anything. I think it's something as an industry, you know, we really need to face because, yeah, you can get a lot of some cheap food for whatever, but is it really healthy for people? You know, we, we really don't want to take all the bread in the, in the pastries from some of the places, but you don't want to turn away a donation. And right. like, if, you know, I'm living in poverty. That's a treat. You know, I mean, the only good thing I can say is, you know, we get from ginger peach, which is like, that's a real good, high quality treat, you know, so we're not going to turn those away, but it, yeah, it's how do we get the other stuff? So it's just kind of another factor that we look at and yeah, you know, we're trying to remain really good, but you know what? It's a little more expensive and we need money for the lights and the freaking and this and the that. <laughs> It's almost yeah. as if food insecurity and nutrition insecurity are two, two totally different issues. I mean, they're related, they're not totally different, but, um, but, but there is a distinction to be made. Yeah, Joyce, I think you undersell yourself a little bit because you're providing, um, you're not only providing those meals, you're providing a lot of structure for folks and you have all those other value added services that you provide in addition to employing people in, in an area that needs employment. And I think, you know, that's one of the, the really hard things to do is, is taking in that people, you know, there's a price for people. There's a price for, there's a price for preparing food. There's a price exactly. for, for, growing food. And those are some of the things that I think they're missing the mark that yes. the, the navigator, I think they're missing the mark. Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I would help you write that story the next time to say, <laughs> leave me my development directors doing. working on something, you know, yeah. because they chose, which of course the meal service is the largest part of our budget, but they chose just that piece. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at impact, I'm like, hang on a minute. <laughs> There's a lot more here. So, um, you know, we're working on, because this is a whole new way for them to figure these things out. And, you know, if you live in Mercer County, you can get a meal for $3.25. So that's what they take it on. But if ours costs five, it's too much. So we fail. Uh, <laughs> it's just this disservice. Um, so, you know, it's we're, we were, we're in the pilot of this new stuff. So we are indeed writing them back a letter. Uh, to kind of talk about it. And so it's been very top of mind, but I think it really addresses the food, the nutrition insecurity part of it. You know, yeah, sure, I can get cheap food, but how good is it going to be for people? Yeah, I'm really appreciating the complexity 
you all are bringing to this conversation. You know, there's so many things that, you know, not everybody knows, you know, not everybody's had the, had like, you know, works within nonprofits or understanding, you know, federal support as well as local support, all different sorts of things. Um, and I think it's important to talk about, you know, how do we get at these larger issues on a local level, but also all the other different ways that we can in, um, create interventions and create change in those ways. Um, so I'm going to give you um, my last question, and then we'll transition to um, some questions from our audience. Um, but my question is, you know, what is giving you hope? What is firing you up? What are you seeing in our community um, that keeps you going? And whoever likes to go first, feel free to. I'll go first. Um... I already touched on it, the fact that there are new programs springing up that are reaching out to literally hundreds of people, hundreds of families. That, um, that, that's really good. And just um, for us at Cornerstone, you know, when the people that are coming during this pandemic, they're very appreciative. And that, that's what keeps you going. You know, it's just knowing that you're you know, that you're addressing a need and it isn't the way we'd like it to be. You know, we'd like to go back to life as, as we knew it, um, but we are addressing a need and that's all the fuel we need. I'm gonna say that, you know, what gives me hope uh, again is some of the newer things that we've seen tried even from even New Jersey EDA. Um, it gives me hope. I mean, the whole sustain and serve program of understanding, you know, the impact um, on restaurants of the pandemic and a way to sort of marry that with the need. I think that's great. Looking at the food deserts, um, that gives me hope. Um, you know, some of these larger, um, you know, efforts. Again, I mentioned the child tax credit, which, you know, um, we're actually going to work to try to get some of our folks to get the money they deserve. Because if you're low income, you may not file taxes. So you wouldn't automatically have got those few thousand dollars. Um, you know, so it's things like that that give me hope, um, you know, that people are beginning to see what it takes, you know, to help pick people up with poverty. You know, I mean, the, the other thing is it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, the fact that there's so many corporations looking for people to work. We've gotten a lot of people hired from hiring drives here, but I'm also, we're also cautious <laughs> that how long are they going to stay? And they're also hiring people who have not had good work histories just because they need people. Um, so I think for us, that's another thing. Like I'm, hope, I'm glad they're really doing it. In fact, we're gonna be meeting with UPS hopefully pretty soon to really just tell them how critical the fact that they're providing transportation is <laughs> to our patrons. They come here, they pick them up, our people got jobs, we give them their meal to take to work with them. Um, mm -hmm. That that's really, really an important thing if we can get more companies to do stuff like that. So those are the things that I see where people, are people getting it? That's kind of when I get hope. If you get, if you start to get some of it, <laughs> then I got some more hope. <laughs> Uh, I definitely agree. The first thing I thought of was the food deserts. Having those designations made is such a huge step in just kind of acknowledging that there's a problem and that falls under like the legislators getting it. And at the end of the day, we can all make our individual contributions, which should not be belittled at all because our collective efforts can make a big impact. But to really drive change, it kind of has to get to that grassroots level with um, government support because that's where you know our tax dollars go, and we can speak very loudly, kind of in those areas. But I think what really fires me up is when we do have our food donation program going. It is, it's a labor of love for sure, and it involves. Um, a lot of a lot of effort on the folks in our dining halls part. I can sit back and say, okay, we're going to do this, but the actual act of putting all of our prepared foods into the proper containers, making sure it's the proper temperature, cooling it down. We actually send frozen items that are prepared 
and we kind of make sure that we have to, I'm sorry, I'm getting a scam call in the background. Um, we have to make sure, <laughs> nonstop, um, we have to make sure that we're portioning things that would work for a two person family household or a, a six person family household. So there is some time and there's logging it and we get a lot of grumbles. You're giving me more work to do. But every couple months, I get a big stack of thank you notes from the folks who are receiving the food at Bentley. And they receive a lot of non-perishables and non-perishables that they have to prepare, but they're, they're all working like we are. So when you, when you get home at the end of the day, how nice is it to be able to have something prepared that you can either pop in the microwave or take out in the morning and, and have a meal ready for you to go that you can supplement with some of those fresh vegetables. Um, so we get all kinds of stories. Some of the notes could be, thank you. I like your food to the whole story about how they became part of Bentley, which some of those stories will literally break your heart. And what I do is I go to a staff meeting and I hand out those thank you notes to every person who's in the stand up. It's a stand up meeting that we have and we're all in a big circle and I give people the option of reading it out loud or keeping it to themselves. And just the expressions on the face of our faces of our team members when they're reading those stories and they're actually making the connection that the work that they're doing, whether it's peeling the potatoes, cleaning up the waste, moving a cart into the freezer, they're all playing a role in helping someone else and they can actually see where all their efforts going. Just to see the emotional connection is priceless to me. And that expression of gratitude just goes so far to, to kind of keeping you going every day. And like Joyce was saying, being centered, it really, it makes it all worthwhile. Thank you all so much. Um, I'd like to turn this space over to some of the folks in our, um, in our uh, audience. Um, I'm gonna try to say, if you wanna raise your hand, I'm gonna try to scroll through and find you. Um, but yeah, if, if someone has a question, please uh, like do use your hand um, emoji or your physical hand and I will call on you. Fun. There's been so much great information shared today. And I feel like I've, I've learned, you know, just a little bit more, a little bit more. If you all had, um, are there any particular resources, things that we should maybe read, watch, see, look at? Like if, if you know, I've kind of been inspired to look into some of the things that you, you tossed out, um, but I don't know where exactly to maybe find some, like what are some things that like you guys look at a lot or you would recommend people if they really wanted to dig into these issues of nutrition and food insecurity and things like that to kind of check out check resources or things for us to check out to learn more? Well, on a state level, um, there's the New Jersey Anti-Hunger Coalition. Um, they're very, uh, Adele Achred, who's their director has been involved in this field for over 30 years. Um, so they, they do a lot of work both with statewide legislation and federal legislation, but they're much more, you know, they're, they're New Jersey, uh, based community food bank in New Jersey is the largest food bank. They do a lot of work too. Um, the other places, you know, uh, they're on a national level. There's a few different organizations. One's feeding America. Um, the other is what they call FRAC food research and action center. They're much more policy focused. But there's always, they're always doing a lot of reports and numbers. Um, you know, this whole issue of cost per meal, I don't know, I'm looking for a good resource about that. I might make that one myself. <laughs> so those are my, those are my immediate thoughts. I, I guess I would, I don't have any resources or anything like that. I just, you know, if you wanna learn more about what's going on, volunteer in one of these organizations it's a you know and just talk to the people that are the patrons and um, make connections with them and they'll everybody's got a story and some of them are reluctant to share but 
some will never stop talking. So um, you learn a lot just by talking to the people that you're trying to help out. Sorry, I'm, very much. I'm Googling as we're sitting here. Um, I just popped up the Alice information and um, the Michelle Nissan that I referenced, he is the founder of um, something called Wholesome Wave. So that talks a lot about um, nutrition and security and that gives you a little history going back to about 2007. And I'm also gonna throw in Bentley, um, just so you can see their story. Um, Rick and I were talking about just how absolutely inspiring the, um, the folks who run that are. And when you talk about a clearinghouse, they sort of, I feel like they're a clearinghouse for a lot of things. They're a conduit to, um, to helping disperse some of the overage that they get to send it out to other folks in need. And they just don't come south to Princeton. They also go up into um, like New Brunswick to Elijah's Promise and some of the other, other places places there. And I might also throw in food donation connection, just so you can see, I know um, other folks work with them, but they are a third party that um, if you don't have the resources to, to go out and find the donation partner, they do it for you. And talk about a clearinghouse of knowing who needs food and where they are. Um, they actually will go out into areas that are yet undefined by them and find the people, the organizations that need the food. So they're, they're kind of cool in what they do. Well, I, I just want to give a shout out to Bentley real quick. And it, just in a nutshell, for those people that aren't, aren't really familiar, and I know Sarah touched on it, but Bentley was started by a husband and wife team. They've got this corrugated metal like warehouse that they've set up like a supermarket right on Route 1, South Brunswick, Monmouth Junction. And... Um, there's really no signage or anything, but they exist for married couples, one of whom may have lost their job. And so they may have gone from making a combined, say, $90,000 a year, and now they're down to 40 or 45. And again, it's tough to make ends meet. So they have to they have to prove that one of them lost a job. I think one of the requirements is also that they have to have a ch at least one child. Am I right, Sarah? Um, I'm not sure what the requirements are. I know that they have an application that's about five pages long. Right. And, um, yeah, they have to meet certain criteria and they also have to do continuing education and go through financial um, training and they actually and have, they have to volunteer there one or one or two hours a week also but the deal is is that they've got this set up like a grocery store and these people that have qualified they have I don't know 30 40 50 families something like that they get to go shopping there um they get their and it's limited you know you can take a certain amount of frozen meat a certain amount of fruit vegetables paper goods stuff like that but it's um it's just a great resource for people that are below the poverty line, people that wanna, you know, get back up for, but for one reason or another, they, uh, they lost a job and, and so they've lost half or more of their income. It's just a great organization. And I guess um, they get their food from a lot of different sources. I guess the university is one, I never knew that until today. And then if Bentley has any extra food, they give it to us and we distribute it to, to our patrons. So it's, you know, it's like one big circle. What I will do is um, I will um, collect the resources that are in the chat um, and then also, you know, stay in com conversation with our partners here um, to, you know, field other resources and we'll be sharing out a resource guide um, soon um, on our website and other places as well um, for folks to learn more and get more connected. Um, what I did see in the chat was a was a conversation about education, and I think between Matthew and Ashley. Um, do either one of you want to expand upon that? Ask our our partners questions around that. I I I, did, I haven't seen Ashley's contribution, but I uh, 
can uh, refer to mind. I was just uh, noticing as we were talking about um, the nutritional value of the foods and uh, how people often go for the chips and, and everything. And also how this um, charity raider was evaluating you on the value of your foods and not looking at the nutritional value that there's a whole educational piece out there. And I was just wondering what, if that enters into your interactions with the people you serve, like trying to talk to them about how, you know, while there's all these foods that have been engineered to appeal to our taste buds, uh, there are these other foods that provide greater, greater value and we might not gravitate towards them as quickly sometimes, but there's, there's reason to go for them. You one know, of the things, oh, go go ahead. Ahead. I was going to say one of the things that we did when we were open, we had a whole separate room off to the side of the dining room where we, we, we would lay out all of our fresh fruits and vegetables and we would give people plastic back and they could go through there. A lot of times they'd, they'd pick something up and they'd say, what's this? You know, I don't know if it would be a collard green or kale, but they'd be like, what's this? And so mm -hmm. I know at one point we were actually providing people not only, you know, what this is, but we, we give them a recipe that they could try using, you know, mm -hmm. not using anything fancy, but, you know, try it. You might like it. Mm -hmm. It's similar, like before, <laughs> prior, you know, to the pandemic, um, we did have some groups coming in that would do education. You know, they would also, they, you know, we said bring bring a sample <laughs> to try to get people in, um, you know, to listen. Um, and some of those groups, one group that we had worked with, and again, mm -hmm. we have probably have a large population of folks that have diabetes that do not know it. Um, and I said, I think, you know, I heard that there's a, there's a rapid uh, A1C test for people with diabetes. And I said, hey, if you could get the rapid test in, test people, tell them they have it, you're more likely to get them in the room. <laughs> it's and, mm. you know, for our folks, transportation's an issue. We try to bring in as many services as we can, which again, right now is really tough. We're just trying to maintain our, our basic services. Um, we do have a few, a few folks coming in, but I hope that's something that we can kind of go back to. It's just mm -hmm. in our life, it's just a really, really hard sell, you know, People are either used to what they're doing, they're stressed, they're in crisis. Um, mm. So they're not necessarily yeah. at the point. So, you know, that was my thing like, well, okay, it's nice to talk like, okay, but do you have diabetes? Yes, you do. Okay, here's what you need to do. I mean, mm -hmm. what we do do is folks who have are diabetic, we do give them an additional uh, bag of food that is really protein, more protein based. Um, so they have something additional that, that, that would meet their needs. Um, but it, it is, it's a tough, it's tough. <laughs> One other thing that we need to consider too is not that all of our patrons have the means to cook the food that we provide them. You know, at best, a lot of people just have a microwave. They don't have stove tops. And it's just a lot more um. convenient to pop a sizzly from Wawa in the microwave than it is to take a bunch of fresh vegetables and make some sort of dish. You know, they just don't have the means to do that, unfortunately. Mm. One of the things that, um, we, actually our kitchen is gonna be being renovated very soon. So once that's done, probably around April, I know, um, you know, our chef and our director of operations are looking at a frozen meal program, um, you know, which I think for folks who might just have the microwave or you're a person of one, you're just saying whatever, something that's already healthy that's packaged um, is a thing that we're looking at and even thinking, well, pantries or other places to provide them to people. Um, again, you know, you have the challenges. We want to make sure, you know, what's what's able to be frozen well. Is it going to taste well? Is it going to last a while? You know, we want to mm -hmm. label. We're not just going to take our meals and throw them in the freezer because that's not that's not. Right. <laughs> but that's something we're looking at as another way. Again, you know, a three part balanced sort of a meal. Hmm. Ashley, was there anything um, you have? 
Um, sure, thanks. Yeah, I was, um, when Matthew wrote his comment, I was thinking also about um, the K-12 space in Sphere as being a great partner. And I was just curious mm -hmm. and a great partner in that they, you know, the goal, I guess, of schools, right, are to serve youth and their families. Um, and not only educationally, but also um, you know, nutritionally and otherwise. So have you all partnered with schools, or school districts? Um, you know, how, how could we maybe do better um, in those in those places as well? And, you know, just sort of that's my lens as a teacher preparation person. So I work with students at the university who want to be school teachers. Um, and so, you know, how, how better can I have and frame these conversations with them? And, and also, sort of like the here and now, but the systemic issues, those big things you were talking about, Joyce, I think are really important conversations to have with our young people too. Anyway, so those are two different things, but um, perhaps anybody has some thoughts on those. Thank you. I think in Princeton there are, um, there are a couple programs. The School Gardens Cooperative is one that um, pops up to me um, that has been really, I don't know where they are right now in, in the space with COVID, but they would do a lot of um, education around different kinds of vegetables. And obviously they have a school garden, so that's part of it. But our chefs would go into the different schools and partner with somebody like um, Chickadee Creek Farm, which is Jess Neeter. And she's a young, vibrant farmer, amazing. And she would like say, okay, we're going to do something with broccoli leaves. And we're like, broccoli leaves. All right. Not something we usually deal with, but um, introducing, introducing kids at a very young age to some very different things. But making it approachable so when you so just like doing kale chips mimics that potato chip it's a good entry entry level to a vegetable that you might not think about so a lot of what we do when we do those outreach kind of things with our team is making things look approachable um matt's smiling he probably one of the things that we do is um jackfruit in the dining halls and jackfruit can replace a lot of meat in very um, equal ways, maybe not nutrition wise, but they do, it does have protein, but you can make it into a taco. And if you eat the taco and it's prepared the right way, you don't really know what you're eating. It has, you can shred it. it so if you're introducing new things, always try to put it in a familiar vehicle and it, it's kind of that gateway into a different world. And that's a lot of what we try to do with education. Hopefully that helps a little. I know in Trenton with the farmer's markets, they try to do that, but we are adjacent to us as Capital City Farm, uh, which is now actually part of the parks, count, parks uh, system in the county. And uh, I know not a lot of education has been done, but I know that that's certainly a piece of it. And, Part of the reason the, the county got involved was they really wanted to have a foothold in the city in an urban area to begin to do some of that, that education. Uh, and it's really nice for us because we obviously get some produce from them and we have for years. It's just this last growing season. And they also have a young dynamic <laughs> farmer of color, <laughs> which is really, um, and he's just great. And I think it just, it lends itself to hopefully when the kids whenever things are a little more back to normal of having more field trips. I know several years back, they did have Boys and Girls Club come out and stuff. So there are some opportunities there, I think, with the kids. And I think that's a great place to start. Wonderful. Any other questions? Coming up. So I will share one last question. Um, and one of the things that I'm wondering is like, what do you all imagine like the university, the universe, what do you think the university community's like responsibility is when it comes to food access in our local community? You know, there's so many folks here um, that are part of this local community, um, you know, at an institution like Princeton, um, you know, what do you hope 
we do? What do you hope we continue to do? What do you see us um, engaging in? How can we support? The first thing that comes to my mind because you're a university is everybody has to take a Matt Desmond course. <laughs> you know, I mean, learning just about poverty and those particular pieces to me, I mean, the service part is always great, but at that, getting that understanding of that, that, you know, and then, you know, we've had several of his students come here. So I think that is an important piece, but almost kind of making that like a requirement, like community services, a requirement, like Poverty 101, I don't, I don't know, but I know he certainly had a great impact on um, a lot of the students that he's had. And um, they've, they've come here and they've written some, you know, very interesting papers that they share um, and, you know, can even contain some great ideas. So that, that's top of my mind. Again, thinking big picture, making changes, next generation. Learning is key. Gotta do your homework. Sarah, Rick. Well, Sarah's part of the university. Um, I, I don't really have any uh, expectations of the university. I'm thankful that when we get volunteers, I think it's wonderful that the university donates their food to places like Bentley and stuff like that, because then it comes back to us. We in turn have given, uh, I used to have a great relationship with uh, a student at Princeton who lived in um, 2D, 2 Dickinson, the uh, vegetarian co-op at the university. And anytime we had leftover vegetables or bread, I would just take it down to him. He's graduated now and I don't have a liaison there anymore, but it's, you know, we don't wanna waste anything. And so, and I know that they appreciated it. Um, I don't, I don't have any expectations. I just, I just want to, you know, especially during COVID, I just want to keep the, the boat afloat here. Okay. All right. Anything else from our wonderful audience? Thank you all so much for engaging. Anything else on top of your minds? All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, you know, the lessons and the connections and the engagement continues. Um, you know, we have a couple other opportunities to learn and hear from community partners the rest of this month. Um, you can still sign up to take part in service, um, whether it's on campus or in our local community. Um, please do be in contact with us because month of service is not just about this month. It's about using this month as a time to get connected and to learn, but to help folks sustain and find new connections. And, you know, I really hope that you take some time to engage and then maybe, you know, follow, follow in some awesome footsteps here. Uh, think about how you might be able to spend some time at task or, you know, if you're maybe a little further away from campus, you know, what's happening in your own neighborhoods. Um, and so really appreciate it all. Thank you so much to our community partners, to our panelists for sharing so much wisdom today. Um, much gratitude to all of you. And, you know, we look forward to being in service with all of you. Thanks, Thanks for the very much, Carolyn. It was time well spent. Thanks very yeah, much. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Learned a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.